Readers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. I'm your host, Stephanie McGrath, and the Publisher Operations Specialist here at Kobo Writing Life. Hi there, this is Marina Ferreira. I'm the Publisher Operations Coordinator for KWL. This week we interviewed Jackie Lau. We first came across her on Twitter when she had this really great thread about her first year self-publishing and how she was able to make Kobo work for her. We also talked to her about diversity and romance and one thing that I was really excited to talk to her about was also setting her books in Toronto which we'd hardly see these days. And uh, another interesting thing we talked to her about was Twitter and how she said that Twitter was one of the best things that she did for her writing career. And make sure to stay tuned to the end of this episode because we have a very exciting offer on what is Jackie's titles so please keep listening. So thank you Jackie so much for joining us on the Kobo Writing Life podcast. No problem. Uh, so just to begin, we first I first saw you when you posted on Twitter about your first year self-publishing. And so just before we begin and talk about your journey for your first year, um, can you just tell listeners a bit about you and why you decided to self-publish? My first romance novel, or actually it was a novella, was published in 2014. And I uh, published under the name Laura Jardine with a bunch of different small presses. Never really sold very well at all and had... Uh, some not great experiences with publishers. Uh, So I decided I wanted to try self-publishing, start a new pen name and have a very clear brand. Um, And so I started, my first book came out in uh, May 2018, and that was Grumpy Fake Boyfriend. And uh, since then I've published, I guess it is one, two, three, four, six novels and one novella. Short novels. That's amazing. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's impressive. That's... Yeah. I am so amazed. <laughs> and I had sort of planned it when I, I decided to self-publish more than six months before I started to. So I was sort of okay. like saving up to uh, prepare it so I could release a bunch of books two months apart. Oh, okay. That's so that, awesome. Yeah. So, so that was planned that way. Okay. So you did have a plan before you first yeah, started. Yeah. Like, I mean, and I've been writing for quite a while, so I have a good idea of how fast I can write mm-hmm. and how fast I can revise and stuff like that. So That's that amazing. That was helpful, too. Just out of curiosity, because you mentioned all the prep and stuff that you did before, what kind of prep did you do? Like, because I, I imagine you mentioned, for example, saving up. So that comes with cover design and things like that. Is that the kind of prep that you had in mind? So or? it was more just I planned to put out for four novels in the first year. And I had, before 2018 started, I already had all the first drafts written and most of them revised. Just so I could focus more time on the business stuff. Because mm-hmm. I didn't know how long it would take me to learn everything. Mm-hmm. So that's what I mean. And then I, I started getting the covers done maybe the beginning of 2018. So what uh, business sections did you want to focus on when you first started publishing? Is there things that, any ideas that you wanted to do, like marketing-wise, or? Not really. So I sort of wanted to start self-publishing uh, in, like, some people in self-publishing are kind of intimidating. They seem to do so many different yeah. things and yeah. still put out a book a month. So I sort of wanted to sort of snort, start smaller and, and ramp up, mm-hmm. um, just so I didn't have to learn everything right away. So. I only had ebooks up until about a month ago, actually. Um, so that was the idea, just to focus on ebooks. Um, and I always plan to publish wide, uh, not uh, not just exclusive through Amazon. Though some romance writers do that, um, and that was uh, for a bunch of reasons, but partly because uh, my books are set in Canada, and mm-hmm. I think. Actually, among my sales, I sell better on Kobo than Amazon in, ca- in Canada. Um, so I think if you want to reach a Canadian market, then Amazon exclusive is not really the best way to go. Yeah. So that's why I always want to go wide from the beginning. So, uh, yeah. Perfect. That's pretty cool. Was it what you thought it would be when you <laughs> first... I don't know if you had an idea of when you so, were like... Like, I was just really s- sort of scared of all the things I would have to learn how to do and stuff. And I still, like, even just setting up print books, like, last month was just really um, nerve-wracking for me. Because uh, I'm not good with all that different stuff. And my background's in engineering, so I don't have any, you know, transferable skills from that, really. Um, I'm sure there's something. <laughs> engineering seems Yeah, yeah. I, I'm good with numbers. So, like, well, like that doesn't really scare me to see big spreadsheets of numbers. I didn't really have other kinds of skills from my job before. So I had sold really poorly. Um, I had 12 ranging from novelettes to short novels with, with, I think, four different publishers. And one I had sold to, but the publisher shut down before mm-hmm. uh, the book came out. And I had sold really poorly. And I was surprised that, um, I guess, the title for my first self-published book was Marketing Genius on my part. <laughs> and that was, I was surprised when I got so many sales mm-hmm. uh, and pre-orders for that book. That's awesome. 
it was a grumpy fake boyfriend. I guess it yeah. hits every romance reader. They know exactly what they're getting into. That's true. Yeah. Boyfriend's probably fake when you read the thing, so that's another, like, favorite trope. So it hit all the... Yeah, and often I think fake relationship books, they say either pretend or fake in the title. Mm -hmm. That's pretty common. But, like, I think grumpy is not a word that's really used in romance. I catching that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. that part stood out more. Because some people do like grumpy heroes. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that somehow it sort of took off. Not like amazing, amazing, oh my God, but um, <laughs> still like way better than I had done um, previously. That's awesome. Yeah. So, was there anything that surprised you or like a mistake you made that you have now known not to do again? I don't think really. I sort of wish that I had two two book series and I sort of wish I'd had the chance sort of thought of making one of those a longer series but they're mm -hmm. sort of stuck because they were based on families mm -hmm. and one of them there were two sisters so there is nowhere else mm -hmm. to to go and the other one was a family where there was there were cousins but mm -hmm. the other cousins were already married so mm -hmm. okay so I sort of wish I had thought about doing a longer series to start with then you can more push uh, the first book for promo and then have sell through whereas when you only have a two book series there's only one more book for them to buy. Mm -hmm. True. Um, so the first series is probably actually going to have a spinoff series uh, mm -hmm. next year. Mm -hmm. So I had sort of, so in retrospect, yeah, I, I sort of think maybe I should have tried to have a longer series to start with, but I don't think that was... Um, I don't think you would have, like, it's hard to know, right? It's hard to know, and I wanted two different series, because, like, what if one of them didn't do well at all? Mm -hmm. So that was sort of why I had done that. And I also sort of wish I had flipped the order of the books in the second series. Although I would have had to change the way it was set up a bit. Mm -hmm. Just because the first book in the second series, which is uh, Not Another Family Wedding, has some things that some romance readers really want and wish they saw more of in romance, but that maybe don't have universal appeal. Oh, okay. And I th okay. so it's hard for me to um, push that series when... So the first book, she, she's uh, they're both 36, and she's determined that she'll never have children. And that doesn't change. And she's also, well, as grumpy heroes are kind of popular, grumpy heroines, not so much. Mm -hmm. That's and the, true, yeah. The book also has deals with, like, abortion and postpartum depression, and she's a climate change scientist and um, stuff like that. And, like, some people do really like the book and have emailed me about it, but I just think um, the second book in the series had more uh, sort of wider appeal, and if mm -hmm. I flipped the orders, it might have been a little bit better for me but I like trusting things <laughs> uh, yeah I was, I was just gonna ask what it's like for you if you've noticed anything come out of breaking those norms and those tropes and trying different things like that is that something that you get a lot of feedback on from the readers so like um so some people do really appreciate heroines who don't want kids and don't change their mind mm -hmm. because sometimes they say that and then they change their mind in the epilogue all of a sudden mm -hmm. and I've had when people, there was a discussion on Twitter about books with abortion, and someone mentioned my book, and I put it on sale, and I sold quite a bit for that. So, in general, it's been positive, but, like I said, I haven't really tried to promo that in a wide... Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not like my books are the only ones that mm -hmm. do these things, of course. There are others, and it's easier to do it as an indie author, mm -hmm. yeah. not having to worry about what the publisher is going to say. That's true. One of the biggest perks... That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and your books are very diverse. Is that something mm -hmm. that you found is easier to do self-publishing? Because you can do exactly what you want. <laughs> when I decided to self-publish, like, I decided I would focus on, like, books with Chinese-Canadian uh, heroes and heroines. Sometimes both the hero and heroine, sometimes just one, sometimes one of them is biracial, uh, because that's my background. Um, my mom's Chinese-Canadian and my dad's white. I hadn't... I think when I first started writing romance, I wrote mostly white characters, because that's what I was seeing in the books yeah. that I read. Um, and that was also many years ago now, so it wasn't... There was diversity, but not as much as there is now. And uh, so I just was sort of afraid to do anything too different at the beginning. And I did occasionally write Asian characters. I had some sort of not great feedback when I told uh, my editor, my last publisher, uh, that I was sort of thinking of self-publishing with Chinese-Canadian heroes and heroines, and she said something like, as long as they just happen to be, you know, Chinese Canadian, but they're still relatable, and sort of a, <laughs> it was sort of an awkward uh, exchange. Yeah, <laughs> sort of implying that people like me aren't really relatable in a normal way. 
What an awkward situation to be. <laughs> I'm just imagining yeah. this this conversation in the yeah. room, the two of you sitting across from each other. I mean, it was on the phone, but oh, okay. So, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I won't give any more details about yeah. exactly what happened. Um, but so there is definitely some of that. Um, mm-hmm. And I wasn't with big publishers who were trying to sell my book to you know the widest, biggest possible audience. But so I did experience some of that, but mostly I just hadn't. It just wasn't something I focused on, but I decided uh, as I went along that it was more important to me and something I wanted to write about. Um, So yeah, that was definitely part of my brand and part of my focus when I started self-publishing. I definitely noticed, like like it wasn't in my brain that I would be reading romance and like both characters would be white, but like now that I am Mm -hmm. more conscious of it, I'm just like picking up other stuff because there's so much out there and I just, I don't know, I make an effort now. I don't know if you do the same. So the thing is even like, I thought I was reading pretty diversely, and, you know, the Rip Bodice had uh, their report of diversity in mm-hmm. publishing, yeah. um, where I think publishers have, like, maybe 7% yeah. diverse authors, and I was like, oh, I know I do better than that in my reading, so I looked, and I still only had 25 to 30%, Okay, which is much higher than what's published by publishers, but still, it was not as much as I thought I was reading. Yeah. So after that, I started paying more attention to it, and then I'd probably read about... 50 50 right now mm-hmm. yeah just being aware of it definitely has helped and there's been i think there's a lot more diversity in romance than there used to be definitely um so it, depending on where you hang out in the romance community online it's pretty easy to find recommendations and such so very true i noticed that a lot going through covers for books that come in when we receive them it's your job it's it, yeah it's it's what i do i'll mm-hmm. go through submissions and things like that and Every cover, not every cover, but most of the covers, like, a white guy, a white guy, a white guy, a white guy, a white guy. <laughs> I'm like, okay, they all look exactly the same, yeah. and it just, it makes you wonder. So, like, I can't see this just from uh, the re- podcast, obviously, but... Ah, love so it. Love it. Love it. So, Grumpy Fake Boyfriend is actually the only one of my books with a white guy on the cover. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I guess one of them, uh, it's a couple, and the guy is too, but you can't see him very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of my books, like I focused on having, I wanted the Asian characters on the cover. So I spent a lot of time on stock photo sites. Oh, yeah. Looking. Is this a stock photo man? Yeah. Oh, damn. That's He's nice. <laughs> um, so, and there there are definitely some, um, like, and I'm pretty happy with the ones I found, but like, mm-hmm. I feel like I know exactly what's out there, and yeah. eventually I'm going to run out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Like, there are definitely, I, I think I had been given the impression that it was, uh, wor- the situation was worse than okay. it actually is. That's not saying a lot, um, but uh, there are definitely some great photos, but there isn't a huge number. And couples are pretty tricky. And I mean, a lot of romance books these days just have a hero on the cover. So mm-hmm. many of my books are just the hero. Some, three of them are couples. Uh, and two of those couples, they're both Asian, and that's easier than the interracial couples for me to find, I think, because those are stock photos from yeah. mm-hmm. Asia. Mm-hmm. But, like, if you want a Asian guy and a white woman, like the ultimate pie date party, there's almost nothing. Mm-hmm. There are a couple, but very few. <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah, so... Um, more photos, photographers. Yeah, I, and I know th- th- this is just in sort of on Shutterstock and mm-hmm. normals. A lot of them, they all have the same pictures anyway, right? Mm-hmm. I haven't really looked at specialized uh, stock photo sites. That There are some that focus more on diversity and stuff, but um, I haven't gone to that point yet. But Do you create your own covers or? No. Okay. <laughs> you just pick the image. Uh, so, yeah, um, sometimes uh, self-publishers... Uh, some people do the covers themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't have the skills to do it. I don't. I think the stress. <laughs> <laughs> I do love me. this cover. Yeah. It's, I love the CN Tower in the background. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, it's like Toronto. Like, you can flip it over. Love the it. Of the city. Love it. So I didn't have the skills to do that. So I found a cover artist. Uh, I was like, this is definitely going to be so much better for me than trying to do it myself. And sometimes. Uh, indie authors pick the pictures themselves sometimes they let the cover artists do it but I definitely wanted to pick the pictures myself mm-hmm. um, so I do do that but everything else she does so <laughs> imagine in a traditional publishing house you wouldn't you would never I mean you'd have to be 
who like JK Rowling or something like that and be like okay I want this person on my cover uh, yeah well like sometimes they do they do cover sh- shoots for um, yeah romance books sometimes even if you're not huge huge you sometimes depending on the situation mm-hmm. they do do uh, shoots I mean some indie authors do as well but you have to kind of be a lot bigger than me for that to be worth it <laughs> it's, it's an investment type of thing yeah, yeah. So yeah, but whenever I see a cover with a East Asian guy on it now, like I, I always recognize. Oh really? Photo. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. There aren't that many. Oh no. <laughs> uh, well, get photographers. Listening, I know. Get your get photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for my next book, actually, um, so do you know what a durian is? It's this big yeah. uh, fruit that's very spiky. The, so the, I think the so. one that doesn't smell that great. It smells terrible, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, that book was written to go with a particular set of stock photo images yeah. with, uh, like, some sexy East Asian guy holding a durian. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's not out yet, so I don't have a, a book to show you. <laughs> but, like, I actually wrote that book for that those particular for, stock photos. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so, you, I mean, I guess a little bit of the inspiration comes from it. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah, so... That's awesome. So do you find that Kobo differs from other retailers? And then it could be in terms of marketing or just like how you present your book and just what your perspective is on that. I am also on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, and Apple. Uh, Barnes & Noble and Apple are through draft to digital though I don't go direct. Like, in comparison to Amazon, which thankfully I haven't had to personally contact yet because that um, honestly doesn't sound fun. Like Kobo, I've contacted a couple times mm-hmm. and gotten feedback or gotten a response relatively fast. Probably so one I, of us. Could, could I be. think it was Tara. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, Shout out to you, Tara. <laughs> so, uh, like, at least that's one of the things I like about Kobo is that if you do have a problem, you know that you will be able to actually talk to a, a real person mm-hmm. um, to, to be able to solve it. So I think Kobo is more than Barnes & Noble or Apple for me right now. Um, and Barnes & Noble, I don't know if it's exclusively the U.S. or mostly the U.S. That's a good question. That's a good question. I'm not actually sure. Maybe majority U.S., I would say. Yeah, yeah. and I don't actually know what countries those sales come from mm-hmm. through Draft Draft Digital. If there's a way to find out, I don't know. So one of the main differences being is that I have a lot of Canadian sales on Kobo mm-hmm. and some Australian as well. Um, that's, I don't think I really have uh, through the other ones. And also I've noticed that Kobo gives me a steadier income than they do. I don't know exactly why that is. Mm-hmm. So like when I first put out Grumpy Fake Boyfriend, I actually did do quite well in Barnes & Noble, but those sales like tapered off. I haven't really maintained as mm-hmm. good of a base level on mm-hmm. them. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but um, I have more of a steady uh, predictable income on Kobo. Interesting. For whatever reason that. <laughs> I mean, I do do some of the promotions and stuff. Like, I did the VIP sale Mm -hmm. that was pretty recently. I've done two of those and a few others. Okay. Yeah. Do you think there's any strategies uh, that other authors could use to help increase their Kobo sales? Or just make sure it's on Kobo, basically? I mean, make sure it's on Kobo, I guess, is one of the big ones to start with. Yeah. And just, I know I've definitely gotten, like, a bunch of... uh, dedicated readers from some of the Kobo promotions, so they're really easy to sign up for, so I do suggest uh, playing with those. But you have to go direct through Kobo, mm-hmm. you can't go yeah. through Draft through Digital or It's a very special perk we have. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I originally was going to go through Draft through Digital for Kobo, but someone told me not to, and then I was like, well, since I want to focus on Canadian sales too, so I, I did go direct with Kobo, and mm-hmm. I'm glad I did. But Thanks to that person, whoever they are. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have your older series uh, available online as well as ebooks now? The ones that you had through publishers, um, that... so they're mostly still for sale through the publishers. Okay, two of them had print versions as well. The rest mm-hmm. were just ebook only. Um, they're still available, but I don't really promote them at all. And mm-hmm. some of them, so, I, yeah, they're they're sort of some of them are erotic romance and sort of mm-hmm. different from what I'm writing now. So I I, um, I don't really see doing anything mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. them for now. I might get my rights back for some of them, but I don't intend to mm-hmm. publish them under this name. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. A, a lot of people will separate even just the genre genres that they yeah. write by different pen names and things like that. And you can have different marketing campaigns and things based on your needs for each one. Yeah. I mean, it's possible, but I'm likely I'll go back to writing erotic romance too and self-publish. And then I would probably 
put that under that name. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not really something I'm seriously thinking about for now, mm -hmm. but it's a possibility at some point. Uh, so my favorite question is, what's one of the best things you've done for your business? Mm -hmm. Could be anything. Do you mm -hmm. have something? Probably just being on Twitter a lot. Yeah? <laughs> I agree with that. I, I'm always on Twitter reading I am things. a Twitter person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I actually haven't done a lot of actual advertising, and I'm not as, as on Facebook as much, but definitely, like, my stuff gets retweeted a lot on Twitter and actually for Grumpy Fake Boyfriend um, uh, when Courtney Melange retweeted it I, I got more than 100 <laughs> pre-orders in the next 24 hours so like she hadn't read it um, but that was just based on the title and she commented on it so if you do have the right people like retweet your stuff it actually yeah. does make can make a big difference mm -hmm. yeah because just the pre-orders from that were already more than I had sold from my other books and I just generally am part of the romance community on Twitter mostly uh, following like other authors of color and stuff so I feel like among a certain group of romance readers a lot of people know who I am mm -hmm. um, even if I'm not a huge author so and I like Twitter so that's why I'm there do you focus solely on Twitter compared to other social media platforms? So I'm on Instagram too, and they just mostly post pictures of donuts and <laughs> flowers at this time of year. Um, I like that. I like yeah. Instagram, but like yeah. I don't spend as much time on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have a I have a Facebook page that I don't use a lot, and I have a Facebook group with two other authors mm -hmm. uh, that we just started in January. Um, so that's been going pretty well as well. But we can plug that in if you <laughs> if you wanted to share. Um, and it, it's called Northern Heat. Oh, oh, yeah. Canadian. Love it. Love yeah. it. <laughs> Love it. We'll, we'll have all the links in the show notes and everything. Yeah. I was just thinking to myself, maybe because I'm a book nerd, I'm probably, like, I always follow authors on Twitter. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I literally don't use Twitter for anything else but, like, reading yeah. tweets. So I wonder why that's the place I decided to, like, follow authors. I noticed that at least the people that I follow, because I follow both readers and authors, mm -hmm. and like people do readathons and things like that and like with the hashtags I feel like it, you can be a lot more eloquent with your thoughts on Twitter I feel like platforms that, like something like Instagram people will do the pretty photos and stuff it's mm -hmm. more of that visual impact whereas Twitter you can go a little bit deeper into yeah these topics and I feel like usually the people that are on Twitter for books they're there to find a specific thing. Or they're, and, like, open to or, discussions. Or open to discussion or open to new recommendations. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm generalizing, <laughs> but I do love my Twitter I, book like, people. Like, maybe that's what we do. Yeah. But, yeah, that's yeah. what I enjoy Twitter for. Yeah, because that was the first time that I had heard uh, of you. It was on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And it might have been one of these random retweets or something like that that someone did. And mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I know some people say that Twitter doesn't sell books, and if you... I disagree. I, disagree. <laughs> you know, I have you... bought plenty. <laughs> but, like, I, I sort of think, like, I mean, the common thing is you can't just be selling your books most of the time. You have to be tweeting about other stuff, so yeah. people want to follow you and such. And, I mean, I think that's fairly common, but it just takes up a while to build a, a presence that's and true. stuff. And I don't that... even have a huge number of followers, but less than 2,000 but um it's one tweet <laughs> yeah but uh and I've never really had tweets go outside the romance genre so mm -hmm. which is probably a good thing because that's when people get harassed <laughs> mm -hmm. honestly um so I haven't had really tweets go really viral mm -hmm. um but just being around in the romance community I think it's been good that way so is there anything that you do actively to be involved in the community other than Twitter? Are you in touch, let's say, with other authors for some, like, maybe writing support or just business support, things like that? So I'm part of the Romance Writers of America at Toronto nice. chapter. Yeah. So I go to those meetings every month um, and I met a lot of people in person from that. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you guys do? I'm I just know, curious. I'm curious. So we have... Um, <laughs> We meet once a month and we have a speaker. Usually it's just uh, one to four in the afternoon at a library and they talk about different topics. Yeah, the last one just this past week uh, was a lot about plotting and okay. uh, method that used a lot of post-it notes. Mm -hmm. And I like plotting, but uh, <laughs> not with post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, I, I work in such like a linear fashion that I find I don't really need a lot of things that people use like because I work in such a linear way anyways it's I can just like start a document and mm -hmm. um, it's pretty straightforward for mm -hmm. me but I do always want 
to think about things in different ways and how to make my book stronger and, and stuff like that. So, Do you find it tricky to write romance? Sort of, but yeah. so I actually came to romance first more as a, so when I started writing in 2010, I was focusing on women's fiction, mm-hmm. but like chiclet women's fiction, so sort of similar, like Bridget Jones. And then I sort of realized my first book was more or less a romance. And also around that time, my mom died. So I liked uh, knowing I was going to get a happy ending. So I read romance for a year before I started writing it while I was writing women's fiction. And then I guess I started writing romance in maybe 2012. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't come through romance. Many romance readers, you know, they took their mom's or their grandma's books when they were 12 years old and (laughs) stuff like that, hid them in their textbooks. I don't my mom didn't read romance, so I don't have, like, the, the long, long history with mm-hmm. the genre that some people do. Um, but, I mean, it's been, like, eight years now, so uh, it's p- quite a while now. So the challenge, I guess, sometimes with writing contemporary romance is how can you believably keep people apart for so long? Yeah. <laughs> that is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In a way that doesn't just piss off the reader, right? Yeah. Like um, when, yeah. Sometimes I'll read them like, just communicate. Yeah, and so, so you don't want, I mean, we miscommunicate all the time, but like if you have 100,000 words that could have been resolved yeah. by communicating, it yeah. would be frustrating, right? So that's what's sort of hard is figuring out how to keep people apart. And <laughs> how to cause trouble. <laughs> yeah, and, because like you have to cause co- some conflict to keep, keep them apart, but yeah. like you don't really want to because, you know, you made them these characters up and you want to be nice to them but you can't just be nice to them all the time Mm -hmm. right so yeah sort of my goal right now is to put out four to five books a year between novels and novellas so that's fast but not not crazy fast Mm -hmm. (laughs) i would say for self-publishing it's a healthy fast yeah because we see all extremes yeah so so there's a lot of people talk about like putting out a book a month now and self-publishing and stuff and i know i'll never be able to write a book a month so that's the useful thing about having gone into self-publishing, having already written for so long, is mm-hmm. that I do know exactly how fast mm-hmm. I can write. And I am a pretty, I write at a pretty steady pace. And I, for more, some people it varies a lot more between projects. It doesn't for me. Mm-hmm. So I do think that putting out about 250,000 words a year, which could break down in a few different ways, but my novels are about 60,000 words, mm-hmm. is sustainable for me. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to drop on the quality, so no. you always want to go at the pace that you feel like yeah. you're not compromising on that, right? Yeah, so I feel like that's a good pace for me. Um, I could maybe spend some more time trying to learn more about advertising and stuff, but I feel for writing, I'm probably doing as much as I should be doing if I want to maintain it. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that some people build up backlists of 50 books and they've been writing yeah. like four years and like... <laughs> <laughs> Some people came out with 30 books this year alone, and I don't know how they have the time. I know. Oh, man. Yeah, so that just isn't me, so... <laughs> yeah. Do you write every day, or what's your schedule so, like? So, like, I usually work on writing stuff six days a week, but I work on one project at a time. So when I'm working on a first draft, I'm just working on the first draft. When I do a first draft, I can write about 4,000 words a day, but I switch off to another project, and I might work on the second or third draft of that. So then I'll just work on revising for a few weeks. And so I just keep switching off projects that are in different drafts. Mm -hmm. I have about three drafts per book. And Mm -hmm. then it goes to the editor. So, Cool. How many drafts do you have going right now? So I have one book that's with an editor, one that I've done two drafts and have to do one more, and one that I'm almost in the first draft. Awesome. All right. Three books at once. I have one other question, actually, that now I remember what it was. (laughs) Um, No, because I saw the CN Tower on the cover of Mm -hmm. uh, The Ultimate Pie Day Party. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, because every time I feel like I read a romance book, they're in L.A., they're in Mm -hmm. California. Exactly. Like, in New York. And it's so nice to read about stories in your, like, where you live. Yeah. And so I saw the the CN Tower, and I just wanted to hear about that. I mean, I'm sure... as like if you live in the city it makes the most sense but yeah so that's partly just I'm lazy and I <laughs> want to write what I know exactly. and I know Toronto, yeah. and I do really like Toronto um and since I'm writing pretty diverse romance and um, it makes sense yeah and I do get tired of so there's 
two things I get tired of. One is everyone in New York is white. Yeah. Which happens some, in some Even real, though in real life that's no, not the case. Even though <laughs> New York is sort of similar to Toronto in yeah. diversity. Um, it's not uncommon to read romances in New York where everyone's white. And you're yeah. just like, I don't understand. Um, <laughs> or like the one person who isn't is the cab driver and that's it. And that just isn't doesn't really make sense Mm -hmm. um and then there are small town romances are still pretty popular and not every small town is entirely white in these books but there sure are a lot of yeah 99 white small towns in romance Mm -hmm. that sort of feel like they're supposed to be idyllic and yet you're like your ideal world doesn't have any people of color in it this is kind of strange in general i find small town doesn't romances don't always work for me but Mm -hmm. um there are definitely some i've liked so I wanted to set books in Toronto because um, that's where I'm from. I lived here my whole life, and it's a little bit different. But and I, I do put um, a lot of Toronto stuff in the books. They're not just some vague city. Like so, this series is set uh, in Baldwin Village, which is mm-hmm. a stretch of Baldwin Street where there are a lot of restaurants and stuff. So it's a fictionalized version of Baldwin Village, uh, where I made up all the businesses, and. I have another book too, um, Mr. Hotshot CEO, which shows a lot of them exploring the city together. Um, so yeah, some people have commented that they really like that aspect of the mm-hmm. book um, because the location is an important part of the books. It totally brings the story alive to me. If I know where the people yeah. are, it's a whole different experience. Um, thank you for writing <laughs> <laughs> your stories in Toronto. <laughs> and, yeah, there aren't a huge number. Of, I mean, I can think of a few more, but not aren't a lot. I just have one in my brain and I just remember being like, oh my god, that's Young and Dundas Theater. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I picked out of it. Off the top of my head, I can't even think of anything. I don't know why that is, because Toronto's very popular like you said, and like diverse, like there's so many opportunities for stories in our city. Uh, So Jenny Holiday has a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. So because I know other Toronto romance authors, I Mm -hmm. know probably Oh yeah, let's do some shout outs. Um, So yeah, Jenny Holiday has her bridesmaids be Hating Badly series Mm -hmm. that's mostly set in Toronto. Um, There's a road trip to Florida and some scenes in New York and stuff like that, too. But um, the characters live in Toronto. Uh, She also has a 49th Floor series uh, with Entangled um, that's set in Toronto. Farah Heron had a book that just came out called The Chai Factor, um, which is also set in southern Ontario. The orange cover? Yeah, Yeah, I think I've seen that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think... I think Christine Dabo has some uh, male-male romances that are set in Toronto. We'll find all of these and put them <laughs> yeah. all on the show notes. <laughs> For your Toronto fix. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah. like, uh, of course, when someone asks you that, you mostly blank on, like, you're like, I, I know this, but yes. Sometimes people ask, oh, so what about other books about this? And I'm like, I just blanked on everything <laughs> that I've ever read. Yeah. Happens to me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a big reader, and how do you do that while you're writing? Do you, are you okay usually reading? Because I know a lot of authors are usually like, no, I won't touch a book mm-hmm. while I'm writing so a draft. So I absolutely do read while I write. I read about a book a week. So yes. not, not <laughs> some people read can read like several books a week. I can't read that fast. But I read about a book a week. I mostly read romance, but mm-hmm. not exclusively. I read both contemporary and historical, though I, I have no plans to write historical, but I like reading it. Um, I don't read paranormal. The paranormal series for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's one of those things where, like, I know that there are great books, but I just, um, it just isn't really my thing. So, mm-hmm. and some, I read, like I said before, a pretty diverse, uh, mostly male-female romance, but mm-hmm. I read some MM and FF, too. And I, I don't find it a problem with writing. So I do usually just read later in the day and write earlier in the day so once I'm finished with writing for the day then after that I read I think when I first started writing it did affect me somewhat where like you sort of start unconsciously copying the author's style but I feel like now that I have a pretty strong voice it's not really Mm -hmm. an issue for me but I I do think that did happen a bit Mm -hmm. before that yeah I would pick up an author's style if I liked the book and stuff but yeah I don't have an issue with that anymore and I of course want to see what other people are writing and mm-hmm. I, I mean I just like reading too but yeah there is some aspect of business yeah. uh, associated with that too 
Do you have any, some favorite books you want to call out? So I'm reading the Austin Playbook by Lucy Parker right now. <gasps> yes, she showed it to <laughs> me, and I, I binged through all of them. I couldn't stop. I'm, yeah. I'm all caught up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I'm reading right now, and I really like it. And I recently read uh, The Bride Test by Helen Wang, and that was really good, too. Also, I love so. that one. Yeah. I haven't started yet, but it's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> and then what have you been loving lately? could be anything even like um helpful guides for authors like but like who want to learn more or anything like that is there any resources you look at i liked um i forget the author's name but stranger to Superfan was useful for me to think of as an indie author mm-hmm. i forget the author's name david stranger? david Cogren. Cogren. oh yeah, yeah. we oh, just yeah. had him on the podcast yeah yeah so i found that useful i've been playing with facebook ads but not to great success uh one thing i really liked lately was Always Be My Maybe, the Netflix movie. I watched that last night. <laughs> <laughs> so we had actually a uh, tweet along with my Facebook group oh. to watch that. And it's just really nice to see because I do write some uh, books with two Asian, uh, mm-hmm. Asian Canadian versus Asian American characters. But these stories didn't really make it to screen before. Yeah. Uh, so it's been really great to see uh, that happening. Awesome. So yeah. Really cool. So what can readers look out from you? No, why can't I speak? Can be on the lookout. You say it. (laughs) Um, They expect from you. That was what I was trying to say. But you can say it. And lastly, uh, what can uh, readers expect from you in the future? Anything coming up? Okay, so I have my next book, which is the third book in the Baldwin Village series. Uh, It's called Man vs. Durian, with the durian on the cover. (laughs) And then um, that will be out August 27th, and it's up for pre-order. After that, I'm going to start a holiday novella series. So it's going to be Thanksgiving, Christmas, Chinese New Year, and Valentine's. Awesome. And there's going to be novellas, so they're going to be all like a month and a half apart. Uh-huh. And that series is called Holiday with the Wongs. Um, but uh, I'm still... I'm intrigued already. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm writing the Christmas book for that right now. Awesome. Yeah. And then where can people find you online? Mostly on Twitter, at Jackie Lau Books. Uh, same handle for Instagram. And uh, my website's JackieLowBooks.com. Perfect. Awesome. Thank Thank you you so so much much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we hope you enjoyed our interview with Jackie. And if you are interested in reading one of her titles, we have an exclusive offer for KWL podcast listeners. If you're intrigued, as we were, about her title, Man vs. Dorian, you can actually read the first book in that series for free right now, so that you're ready when Man vs. Dorian releases at the end of August. So the first book in that series is called The Ultimate Pi Day Party, and you can read that free with promo code KWLPODPARTY, that's all uppercase, when you use it at checkout on Kobo.com. So once again, use promo code KWLPODPARTY, all uppercase letters, at checkout on Kobo.com to receive the Ultimate Pi Day Party book for free. This is a limited time offer, only available between August 6th and 20th, 2019. So make sure to check it out. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for Jackie's title, The Ultimate Pi Day Party, we will have a link to the title on the Kobo Writing Life blog for you to check out, along with the promo code in case you want to read her title. This episode was produced by Stephanie McGrath, edited by Kelly Robotham, and music was provided by Tearjerker. Special thanks to Jackie for being a guest on our podcast. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.